In my last two talks, I showed why serious origin of life researchers have rejected both the chance hypothesis and theories of biochemical necessity or self-organization. In this talk, I'm going to examine theories that combine chance and necessity as explanations for the origin of the information necessary to produce the first life. You may remember from one of our earlier times together that the Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin proposed a theory like that. Oparin combined chance and necessity by postulating that once little protocells co called coacervates had arisen, that a Darwinian competition for survival would have ensued. He thought that the protocells that developed more complex metabolic processes and proteins by chance would have been favored by natural selection which is a process that works in a roughly law-like way. Unfortunately, Oparin proposed this idea before anything was known about either the information-bearing properties of DNA or the complexity and specificity of proteins. But there is a big and obvious problem with his approach of invoking natural selection to explain the origin of the information in DNA or the sequence specificity of proteins. You may remember that according to Darwin, natural selection occurs when offspring of various organisms compete for survival. Those with favorable traits that help them survive pass those traits on to their offspring and they spread in the population. Those organisms with unfavorable traits are more likely to die out and those traits will therefore tend to fall out of the population. But notice what's presupposed in this process of natural selection. Already existing organisms. That alone might make it seem suspect to invoke natural selection as an explanation for the first life. If natural selection only occurs once you have living things that can compete, it does no good to invoke natural selection to explain where those living things came from in the first place. You have to have life before natural selection is a factor, or so it would seem. And that's why leading evolutionary biologists during the 1960s were critical of the way that Oparin used the idea of pre-biological natural selection. In fact, one leading evolutionary biologist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, put it very succinctly when he said, pre-biological natural selection is a contradiction in terms. But there's an even deeper problem with invoking natural selection to explain the origin of biological information. Natural selection as a process depends upon something called self-replication, the capacity for pre-existing organisms to copy themselves multiple times, so as to create a competition among their offspring. But self-replication of even single cells depends upon pre-existing information-rich DNA and protein molecules that aid in the copying of the DNA. This, so this approach uh, is what philosophers call a question-begging one, because you can't invoke a process to explain the origin of biological information that only results once you have biological information. As the Nobel Prize winning biochemist Christian de Duve pointed out, theories of prebiotic natural selection fail because, quote, they need information, which implies they have to presuppose what is to be explained in the first place. Again, that's called begging the question. And I have a story to illustrate this fallacy of logic. Imagine, imagine if you would, uh, an absent-minded uh, philosopher of science who is walking home from work one day. I won't name any names. I happen to know an absent-minded philosopher of science. Anyway, this philosopher falls into a hole. At first, he doesn't know what to do. He's stuck, but then he gets an idea. He says to himself, hey, no problem. I'll just go home and get a ladder. So he goes home and he gets a ladder and he comes back and he jumps in the hole and then he climbs out. Now, what's the problem with his thinking and with my story? Well, it begs the question as to where, how the philosopher got out in the first place to get the ladder to come back to jump in in order to climb out again. So begging, and that's similar to what's going on with these theories of pre-biological natural selection. They beg the question as to where you get the information that would get natural selection going. Now, some origin of life researchers have tried to get around this problem by envisioning a scenario where primitive RNA molecules by themselves produce variant copies of themselves that can then compete with each other. These primitive molecular replicators, as they're called, would then, in their view, gradually get more complex and acquire other molecules in association until finally the first life would arise. 
This theory is known as the RNA world, and we'll come back to it later to give a more thorough evaluation of it. But for now, I'd just like to critique one facet of this theory, its inability to account for the information necessary to produce a self-copying RNA molecule. The idea here is that instead of having life that can reproduce, you would have molecules that re could reproduce and get natural selection going. But it turns out that researchers have produced RNA, they have produced RNA molecules in the lab that can copy a, a bit of themselves, between 10 and maybe 20% of themselves. That's pretty interesting, but it's also the best they could do, and it's not enough to actually show that the theory could work. But more importantly, even the limited success that has been achieved in the lab only occurs if the RNA molecule has a very specific arrangement of nucleotide bases. In other words, it must have information before it can copy itself. That means that molecular replicators can't explain the ultimate origin of information. The existence of such replicators would depend on pre-existing information. The same old problem again. And here's another twist. Where do you think the information comes from that enables the RNA molecules to copy themselves even partially? That's right, it comes from the RNA chemists. They fiddle with the sequences of nucleotide bases on the RNA strand until they find one that allows limited self-copying potential. They call that RNA or ribozyme engineering. That's right, engineering. In other words, the information necessary to produce the self-copying molecule came from intelligent design. Now next time we'll talk about the evidence for intelligent design and the theory of intelligent design and, way, and, and why it may provide a better explanation for the origin of the information present in DNA and RNA. In other words, the information necessary to produce the first life. For now, I'd like you to read chapter 13 in Signature in the Cell.